There are many stories of the strange and unusual. Some are true, others are not. Misfits Audio is proud to present Strange Stories, a collection of tales by Mike Murphy that can take place on any world at any time. We hope our cast entertains you with these stories of the supernatural and the fantastic. The year is 2047. We are in the Commonwealth Pub in Boston, Massachusetts. This Beacon Street watering hole has become not only a gathering place for all kinds of people, but for all kinds of life forms. Mankind's first encounter with an alien race, fortunately a peaceful one, having taken place approximately 11 years ago. Since that time, nine other alien races have made our acquaintance without incident. Douglas Pierce, a college professor, sits alone at a table nursing a gin and tonic. He is approximately 50 years old, just over six feet tall, and has an unruly mane of salt and pepper hair. He is looking around as though he is expecting someone. He cranes his neck at the sight of a young man in a leather jacket entering the pub. Could this be the pilot he spoke with earlier? The young man approaches him. Professor Pierce? Yes. I'm Ray Whitfield. We spoke earlier. Yes, please have a seat. Thanks. Would you like another drink, Professor? May I order you a drink? Uh, no thanks. I never drink while I'm talking business. You don't know what you're missing. They make a gin and tonic here that is pure nectar. (laughs) I'll take your word on that, Professor. Please, call me Doug. Okay, and I'm Ray. I hear Professor all day long from my students. It's nice to hear my given name once in a while. Doug it is, then. I'm surprised you found me. It's so crowded in here. (laughs) You described yourself pretty well on the phone, and you mentioned you'd be wearing a red tie. That's right. I had forgotten. If you don't mind cutting to the chase, I've had a long day. I got back from Pluto around lunchtime. Really? (laughs) What's it like there? Cold. Really, really cold. What's on your mind? I want to hire you and your ship. Okay. And what's the destination? The Wintech Cluster. That's pretty far away. Even at best speed, it'll probably take about two weeks travel time. Can you get me there? Sure. My ship can take anyone anywhere, but it won't be cheap. How much? I'll have to look into some things, like the drain on my ship's power reserve. Can you give me a ballpark figure? I'd guess around uh, 30,000 new dollars. Deal. You can afford that? Yeah, it'll stretch me a bit thin, but yeah. When can we leave? That's a pretty new area of space to us Earthers. I'll need to get a bunch of travel permits from the big boys. I'll also want to check my ship's systems. We'll be pretty far from any repair docks. A wise precaution. How long do you think all that will take? About two weeks, if all goes smoothly. So, you believe we could arrive at the cluster about a month from now? Yeah, give or take a little. Then I'd like to hire you right now. Are you sure about this? You haven't even seen my ship. I'm sure. Your reputation precedes you. Have a look at this. Here's my debit card. I scan my thumbprint here. You can see that I have more than enough for the trip in my account. I sure can. Then we have a deal? We do. Is there a contract to sign? Nah, nothing like that. A handshake is good enough for me. Put her there. You just hired yourself a ship. I'll get started on all the preliminary stuff in the morning. We should be good to go in no more than two weeks. Wonderful. How long will you want to stay in the cluster? I'm not sure. Not long. You're the boss. I'll need half the money before we leave, and the other half upon our return to Earth. You'll have it. Why do you want to go there? It's kind of personal, if you don't mind. Sorry, sorry. I don't need to know. No harm done. Have you ever ferried anyone else there? You'll be my first. 
We didn't even know about the cluster until the Oporians came and introduced us to that sector. And that was only, what, six months ago? About that. Say, you're a smart guy, a college professor and all. You don't believe what some people say about the cluster, do you? About it being the gateway? No, of course I don't. Now, if we're done discussing business, how about that drink? The Oporians, the alien race that introduced the inhabitants of Earth to the Wendek Cluster, call the cluster Pruftar, which roughly translated means the gateway to the souls. Earth's scientists have focused their most powerful equipment on the star cluster, with no results worth mentioning. Some very religious people believe that the gateway to the souls is an intrusion into our space of the Kingdom of Heaven, while other people say that is ridiculous. Why is Professor Douglas Pierce willing to spend so much of his money to go there? As a learned man, he couldn't possibly believe in the gateway. Or could he? We'll be back with Whisper My Name to the Stars in a moment. Just as I had suspected, all the pre-flight stuff took two weeks. I left word with a professor to meet me at Platform C of the Mayflower Spaceport the next morning at 8 a.m. He was right on time. Doug, over here! Ray, good to see you again. This must be your vessel. She's a fine-looking ship. Thanks. This is my Esther. <laughs> you named your ship Esther? It's after my late mother. She died about three years ago. I'm sorry for your loss. Thanks. I got her up in space a couple of times before she got sick. <laughs> she said that space flight upsets her stomach. She sounds like she was a wonderful woman. She was. I see you brought your suitcase with you. Yes, I figured I'd need some changes of clothes. I even have some midterms to grade during the trip. The teacher's work is never done. I guess not. I'll show you to your quarters. You can stow your bag there. During liftoff, you'll want to be in the control room with me. It's best protected against the G-forces we'll encounter before we break free of Earth's gravity. I understand. Where's the rest of your crew? It's just the two of us. Is that wise? Don't worry, it'll be fine. During the flight, we'll be on the computer's autopilot. In the unlikely event that anything happens, I'll take over and fly Esther myself. Besides, more crew would mean less profit for me. Speaking of which, here's my debit card. I've set up the transfer to your account. If you'll press your thumb here. There, all done. Great. Let's get on board. Our launch window is only until 8.20. If we miss it, we'll have to go to the back of the line. lifted off without a hitch at 8.14 a.m. The Boston skyline vanished below us, and the block of space enveloped us like a dark blanket. The Esther's artificial gravity kicked in as soon as we escaped Earth's gravitational pull. Quick diagnostics showed all the systems were fine for the two-week trip to the cluster. You can uh, unbuckle yourself from your G-couch, Doug. Now have gravity on the ship identical to Earth. What did you think of the liftoff? It was rather smooth. How were the G-forces? Not too bad. I think you'll find it's pretty smooth sailing the next couple of weeks. That will be fine by me. I have a fair amount of work to do on the way to the cluster. So you said. Will you be needing my assistance? I doubt it. You're a paying customer. I'm not going to put you to work. 
With the autopilot on, we should both be men of leisure. Wonderful. Have you ever been in space before? No, I've never even been in an airplane before. How are you feeling? Just fine. Not nauseous? Not in the slightest. Do some people get ill? Some people do get space sick. If you start feeling it all out of sorts, let me know. I've got some meds that will set you right in a hurry. I'll keep that in mind. I suggest that you try to keep the same schedule you did on Earth. When you go to sleep and wake up, for instance. I always make a point of it. It doesn't do to try and thwart your internal clock. You'll regret it. Gotcha. The clocks on the ship are all set to Eastern Standard Time. The lights are programmed to dim at 8 p.m. and come on full at 6 a.m. I usually have meals at 6, noon, and 6. How's that for you? Works for me. What do you eat up here? Space rations? Certainly not. The galley is fully stocked with a variety of foods and the computer prepares the meals. Your computer is also a chef. In a manner of speaking, it does a pretty good job. Have you had breakfast yet? Yes. Lunch is at noon in the galley. Good. That will give me some time to put a dent in my work. I'll set the computer to send you a reminder message at about 11.45. Thank you, Ray. I'll come and get you then. By the way, the computer's media banks are full of all kinds of movies, books, music. Once you have some free time, I can show you how to tap in. That must be terribly old-fashioned. I brought along a deck of cards. That sounds great. It will be nice not to have to play against a machine. Yes, it all began well. The professor was excellent company. I soon discovered that he had a really good poker face. I'm glad we weren't playing for real money. However, if I had suspected what was going to happen when we arrived at the cluster and how it would still be with me today, I think I might have turned Esther around and forfeited the 30000 That was very tasty. Thank you. Glad you liked it. I told you the computer was a good cook. I wasn't looking forward to space rations. I've had them before. They're not so bad. So, what is the life of a space ferry captain like? Oh, it's pretty routine. What's nice is that my passengers always seem to find me. I've never had to go looking for work. You must have traveled to many fascinating places. Some. Some of the trips are pretty routine. I find that hard to believe. There's so much beauty and wonder all around us. About two months ago, I was hired by this rich businessman from Chicago to take him to Mars. His company was thinking of setting up an office there to manufacture some doodads that can't be produced in Earth's gravity. He brought along a whole tribe of yes-men. I spent much of the trip playing solitaire on the computer while these guys stroked their boss's ego. Sounds dreadful. It was. Fortunately, it was a short hop. Unlike this one. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the cluster close up, though. I hear it's beautiful. I've heard the same thing. Esther is fully equipped with video and audio recording equipment, you know. Is she? We can capture the whole encounter on video for you, at no extra charge. Thank you, I'd like that. Are you going to write a paper or give a lecture about the trip? I may. With the video, it will make an interesting presentation. The trip proved uneventful. Esther performed just as I knew she would. We arrived at the cluster right on schedule. The cluster's billing was absolutely correct. It was an incredibly beautiful sight that filled the view screen. The cluster was composed of seven separate stars swirling about each other in what looked like a random cosmic dance. As each star moved, it left a pinkish trail behind it. The trails of all the stars coalesced into one great pink cloud in the center of the cluster. The swirling cloud reminded me of a painting with the dancing stars serving as the picture frame. I focused Esther's sensors on the cluster. None of the information the computer received made the slightest bit of sense. There it is, Doug. Amazing. It is beautiful, isn't it? No argument there. I've turned on the recording equipment. What's your plan now that we're here? I need to use the communication system. Sure. One problem, though, we're pretty far from Earth. Any message you send will take quite a while to get there. You misunderstand me, Ray. I don't want to send a message back to Earth. You don't? No, I want to send a message into the cluster. Why would you want to do that? Well, 
We've come this far together. I suppose you deserve an explanation. I agree. Have you ever been married, Ray? Never. You? Yes, I was married for more than 20 years. Karen was the joy of my life. She died? About seven years ago. Now I know why we're here. You believe in what people say about the cluster being a gateway to heaven. Let's say that I'm not certain. It's something that I'd like to explore. At the bar, you said you didn't believe in it. Would you have brought me out here otherwise? You would have thought me one of those religious kooks. Good point. I ran some scans of the cluster a few minutes ago. The results were indeterminate. I don't think Esther's instruments were designed to measure whatever the cluster is made of. Could we fly the ship into the cloud at the cluster's center? I can't say what might happen if we tried. It could be lethal. <sighs> I can't let this opportunity pass. Karen died of cancer, you know. I'm sorry. The alien races we met have been able to help us eradicate many virulent diseases, but not cancer. None of the aliens had ever seen anything like it. Karen died in horrible pain. I hope, Ray, you never know the pain of losing a wife. I never thought that I would outlive her. I can understand that. For a long time after she passed, I was certain that Karen was still alive. I was only missing her, that's all. If I came into our bedroom at a certain time, or turned on the light just so, she'd be there. At first, I couldn't sleep in the bed we'd shared. When I finally did, I slept on top of the covers for about a week. When I did get under the sheets, I found I always slept on what had been my side of the bed. Old habits, you know. Every night for more than a month, I prayed that I wouldn't wake up. When I did, I was angry. I wanted to be with Karen so much. That must have hurt terribly. To this day, I feel like someone punched his way into my chest, ripped out my heart, and then shoved it back in the wrong way. Over the years, I've learned to accept what happened, like I have a choice. The pain has gone from heart-wrenching to a constant dull ache. I always feel incomplete. The money I gave you for the trip came from Karen's life insurance. You see why I can't pass up this chance, if there's any truth at all to the idea of a gateway. You can try to contact her. That can't hurt anything. I don't know what luck you'll have. Do you know how to use the comm system? I do. It's all yours. Doug bent uneasily over the comm panel. He rubbed his eyes and squinted at the controls. I think he knew that this moment represented the answer to his prayers or the dashing of his hopes. He pressed a few buttons and turned some dials to focus the comm beam at the cluster. At first... All that came out of the speakers was static. Then... Hello, anyone in the cluster? This is Douglas Pierce of Earth. I'm trying to reach my wife, Karen Pierce. If you can hear me, can you please help me? Again, this is Douglas Pierce. Hello, Doug. Is Ray with you? Yes, he's right here. Ray, uh, <laughs> it's for you. This is Ray Whitfield. Who's this? Don't you recognize my voice? Mom? That's right. It's me, Esther. Where, where are you, Mom? I'm in the cluster. Then it is a gateway. Yes, it is. The stories are right. I see you still have the ship you named after me, son. I sure do. I remember how nauseous I felt when you took me up for a flight. <laughs> you never did get your space legs, Mom. I miss you. I miss you, too. Mom, I gotta go. I've got a customer here who was looking to speak to his wife. So I heard. Can you help him find her? Someone's looking for her right now. Hold on a minute. Can you believe it, Ray? The stories are true. That was definitely Esther. Dad! Dad, are you there? Karen? Is that you, my dear? It's me. Oh, it's so good to hear your voice again. Is there any way to clean up the signal, Ray? I'm afraid not. There's some kind of interference from the cluster. Uh, are you still there, dear? Oh, I'm here, my love. I miss you so much. I could talk with you forever. <sighs> I'm afraid that's not going to be possible. Why? The cluster's intrusion into normal space is accidental. The powers that be up here are already working on a way to close it off. I don't quite understand it. 
I heard someone say the other day that the cluster provides proof of an afterlife, and that faith shouldn't have proof, or it's not faith. That makes an odd bit of sense, I suppose. I don't know how much they're adamant that the cluster is as soon as possible. Karen, do you have any idea what would happen if we piloted this ship into the cluster? Uh, I can't say. I was never much for that scientific techno battle. It could be very dangerous to both of you. But I want to see you again so much. I want to see you too, dear. The trip could... Help me, Ray. Help me get her back. It's no good, Doug. If she's still talking, we can't receive her. It's almost like the signal's being jammed. Jammed. That's it. She mentioned how the bigwigs want to destroy the cluster. Cutting off communication must be their first step. Well, I'm glad you got the chance to talk with her again. What are you saying? This isn't the end. What more is there to do? Do you have a lifeboat on this ship? Why? I can take it into the cluster. I can't let you do that. Why not? It could mean your death. I'm not asking you to join me. I know that. It's my responsibility to bring you safely back to Earth. Says who? The Spacefarers Commission. Who are they? They're a group the Earth government set up once commercial spaceflight came about. According to the bylaws I have to follow, every ship captain has to bring any passengers back to their planet of origin. If I don't bring you back, then... But I don't want to go back. I want to be with Karen. Do you really think you could drive a lifeboat through the cluster and live? There's no way to tell, is there? I can't let you do it. Right. Please, if there's a chance it might work, you can't understand the loneliness, the heartache I've endured for all these years. I have to give it a try. Doug, I... The cluster could vanish any minute. I'll miss my only chance to be with her again. Before I knew what was happening, the professor hit me with an impressive left hook. My eyes closed and the deck of the ship rose up to meet me. I'm not sure how long I was out. When my head cleared, I made a frantic search for Doug. I couldn't find him anywhere. The instruments showed the lifeboat was still in its hangar. The computer couldn't locate Doug on the ship. It was then that I realized one of the spacesuits was missing from the locker. I rotated Esther a few degrees to starboard. That's when I saw him. Doug was suited up and floating in space towards the cluster. There was no lifeline connecting him to the ship. I punched up the comm system. Doug! Doug, answer me! I'm here, Ray. Doug, you have to come back on board. What you're doing is very dangerous. Uh-uh. I'm sorry I had to hit you. You never will let me do this otherwise. It's foolish. You'll be killed. We don't know that. Doesn't it stand to reason? We don't even know if Esther could survive the trip. It's not made of flesh and blood like you are. What kind of chance does a man have against that thing? We'll soon find out. I can already feel the cluster's gravitational pull. Doug, listen to me. You'll die out there. I can still get you a line and bring you back on board. Don't you worry about me. This isn't your problem anymore. You keep yourself and your ship safe. You got me here successfully. Karen and I thank you for that. <laughs> this... this is crazy. I transmitted a letter to that commission you mentioned before I suited up. I told them what I did and I, you should not be held responsible for my actions. Doug, it, it's getting tough to hear you. I'm getting closer to the cluster. My God, it's even more beautiful close up right can't believe. Doug! Doug, come in! Doug! The interference from the cluster overpowered the strength of Doug's helmet transmitter. I stepped closer to the view screen and magnified the image as much as possible. I watched in awe as Doug reached the perimeter of the cluster. It was then that I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I saw... I saw a hand reach out from the cluster, a human hand. There was also the faintest bit of a face visible. Doug reached out and tenderly grasped the offered hand which pulled him into the cluster. Seconds later, one by one, the stars that made up the cluster vanished. The pink trails that had gathered together in the middle of the dancing stars disappeared, like water going down a drain. For about 30 minutes, I tried to contact Doug. No luck. 
I pulled up the video that had been running as Doug made his spacewalk. I was able to focus in on the face that I had seen seconds before the cluster disappeared. I instructed the computer to check out all of its databanks for a match. After a couple of minutes, the computer informed me that one match had been found, in the picture that accompanied Karen Pierce's obituary. That picture was definitely the same face I had seen in the cluster. I piloted Esther to the coordinates of the cluster. There was nothing there now but normal space. It was as though the cluster had never existed. I programmed the ship to return to Earth and engaged the autopilot. It was a much lonelier trip home. I broke out Doug's deck of cards and played several games of solitaire as the stars passed by. This is a top of the hour news update from GNN, the Galactic News Network. Our top story, the WinTech cluster has disappeared. The cluster, believed by some to have been a gateway in normal space to the Kingdom of Heaven, disappeared off of monitoring screens at the Palo Alto Observatory at approximately 7.53 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Observatory spokesperson Carl Jessup said that the cluster simply stopped registering. Scientists worldwide are now training their equipment on the cluster's last known spatial coordinates. Speculation is raging about the fate of the cluster. Did it simply vanish? Was it destroyed somehow? Spokespeople for the Earth's various religions are already commenting on what the loss of the cluster could mean to the religious. Here at GNN, we are trying to reach Captain Raymond Whitfield, who is said to have been in the vicinity of the cluster during its disappearance. We hope to have that interview for you shortly. More news on the hour. Now, back to live talk with Rita Keene. Back on Earth, the Commission had received the Professor's letter. They exonerated me from any wrongdoing in his death. Unbeknown to me, Doug was very highly regarded in the academic and political worlds. I turned over a copy of the video record to the Commission. I kept the original for myself. I still watch it every now and then. I checked my bank balance and discovered that Doug had transferred the other 15000 new dollars he owed me into my account. He knew he wouldn't be coming back when he hired Esther and me. He was joining with Karen, no matter what. I've been asked to appear on all kinds of talk shows, and I've turned them all down. There's really not much new I can offer. The one thing I can offer I'm not telling. A video freeze frame of Doug and Karen's faces at the moment their hands touched. Shows both of them smiling. It's nice to know that Doug is happy again. Our special thanks to the voices of Julie Hoverson as the narrator, Mike Hennessy as Douglas Pierce, James Smagata as Raymond Whitfield, Melissa D. Johnson as Esther Whitfield, Kim Giannopoulos as Karen Pierce, Elise Krawick as the newscaster, and Joyce Bender as the barmaid. Whisper My Name to the Stars was written by Mike Murphy. Producer, Captain John Tadzak. Mixer, Mike Hennessy. Editor, Mike Murphy. Webmaster, Alexa Chipman. Captain John Tadzak is the CEO of Misfits Audio. This has been an original audio from MisfitsAudio.com. We would also like to thank Captain John Tadzak of Misfits Audio for airing this show. This production is for enjoyment purposes only. And I'm your narrator, Julie Hoverson, for Misfits Audio, copyright 2008.